So I've been thinking about um, redoing a video on CentOS streams for a while now, and I haven't haven't done one for two years. So I thought, well, it's probably time. And the nice thing about CentOS streams, it's it's a continuous integration model, so it does have some of the same features as a rolling release, so you can really look at it anytime you want. So what what happened? What 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 went on <laughs> back in uh, 2021 in December? So originally, originally the the way that that RHEL was supposed to work, there was all of these distributions that made up uh, an ecosystem that eventually culminated in Red Hat Enterprise Linux. So you had Fedora at the front. And Fedora was supposed to be the development environment for RHEL. And RHEL would then draw periodically from snapshots taken of Fedora and build itself from there. Um, CentOS was always downstream of RHEL. And so it took its uh, source code from RHEL and built up CentOS. Well, that's all well and good, but what happened was, instead of the developers using Fedora, they all moved over to CentOS. And so that created a problem because the packages that, and in fact, some of the Red Hat packages even, are built on CentOS. And, and so that, re, that meant I had a chicken and an egg problem. I had to have CentOS in order to build Red Hat. And I needed Red Hat in order to build CentOS. <laughs> so there was this kind of a flow that had to occur. Uh, so you would roll, you would get Fedora, you'd get uh, your, some of the packages out of Fedora, and then the kernel out of the kernel.org, and then that would form Red Hat, and then Red Hat would have to build, then CentOS would be built from there. <laughs> it was just... It was pretty crazy. So what was it, what was Fedora really intended for? So Fedora is really a place to experiment with new ideas and to pass or fail those ideas based on the community feedback to them. So and also whether or not it actually improves things or not. So it's meant to be the development platform for RHEL, as we said, but RHEL is but RHEL is so far downstream, literally so far downstream from Fedora, it isn't close enough. So if you're doing development work, you you obviously and testing, you want to be as close to the baseline release that you're gonna you're gonna eventually deploy your software on, to make sure that it's gonna work when it goes into production. There wasn't that guarantee from Fedora because Fedora was so different, different more. It was a more modern kernel, more more modern packages. So and and sometimes a completely different file system. So so what is Red Hat Enterprise Linux? It's a stable, secure, and commercial release. It is meant for operational uh, needs of commercial enterprises in order to maintain five nine six nines, a hundred percent uptime. Uh, but the kernel cannot come from Fedora. Well, why is that? So Red Hat RHEL, the Red Hat team, they maintain relationships with the hardware vendors. So why, does, why is that important? Well, just like if you were to go out and buy new hardware, what's the first thing you're going to look for? You're going you're gonna to look and see, does the Linux kernel that I'm trying to deploy, does it support this hardware that I want to use it on? RHEL is no different. So they work with hardware partners too. And hardware partners are releasing new architectures to go into the enterprise. RHEL has to have a kernel that will support those. And so they cannot draw that kernel from Fedora. They have to draw it from the kernel.org. So, and it's the, the whole RHEL is, is tuned to operational needs. So it's not the place, obviously, to do experimentation. So you don't want to just bring up all the experimental things out of Fedora and then throw them in operations and cross your fingers. That would be a formula for being invited to leave or a disaster. So, yeah. What about CentOS? Uh, so what was CentOS? It was a downstream release of RHEL, and it was the de facto development environment for even RHEL packages, uh, even the RHEL systems that were out there. And we'll, we'll talk about that more later. 
But it ended up creating a what's called a primrose triangle. So a primrose triangle is is a very complex thing. If you were to follow, um, if you were to follow how it works, you would f quickly find that you you sometimes move forward, you sometimes move back, and that's exactly what was happening with Brel. It was moving forward, and then it had to move back and pull in the CentOS releases, and then it would move forward again, and then CentOS would move forward, and then it would move back. It just it's a mess. Yeah. You used to call that a three-ring circus, and it usually meant chaotic uh, operations. So can, now there's 21,000 packages currently deployed in Red Hat. Can you imagine a 21,000-ring circus and then trying to manage that? As an architect, there's no way I would touch that. I'd be like, mm, nope, thanks, bye, see ya. What we ended up with was the promise uh, Fedora would still be the operational, excuse me, the development platform but it would then flow into CentOS streams, and CentOS streams would be more fluid. And the problem is, is that when you have a lot of packages from a lot of different maintainers, they have their own release schedules, and they conflict with Red Hat's so, or Fedora's. Fedora releases twice a year. Um, Red Hat releases about, about once every two years or so. A major release, not a minor, but a major release. And then CentOS Streams was really meant to be a continuous delivery model, so you would consider that a rolling release, even though I don't consider that a rolling release in terms of the way Arch considers them to be themselves to be a rolling release, because it's not. But CentOS Streams would allow the maintainers to be able to push their packages in when they were ready. That could then be integrated, and then CentOS would be then constantly building up the next release of RHEL. Uh, in reality, though, um, so what happened? I mean, why, why, did, uh, why, why did Red Hat go to that model in the first place? So CentOS was pulled directly from RHEL, as we had said. However, some of the CentOS stack went back uh, into RHEL, and, and some of the RHEL came from Fedora. So 21,000 packages, uh, even even Red Hat's own product stack came from CentOS. Like, for example, Red Hat OpenStack, that's built from RBO. That's, that is developed on CentOS. Red Hat Virtualization came from Overt. That was built on CentOS. Red Hat OpenShift Containers came from OKD. That also CentOS. Red Hat Ceph, that didn't come from CentOS. That comes from Ubuntu. And then you had Red Hat Gluster, which that actually that team is actually more on the ball. They, uh, I love that team. They they actually they actually release on many different distros, including RHEL. So what is that? What is the CentOS Streams all about then? So it's about uh, continuous integration, uh, and it's re really a continuously integrated distro. It now normally in DevOps you have the second half of that, which is continuous delivery. Now. In CentOS Streams' case, yes, they do implement the CD, uh, CI, CD model. So it is a full DevOps model. But unfortunately for Red Hat, they can't do the CD part. And we'll talk about why. So the develop it is a developer-forward distribution, meaning that developers can push there or they can develop there. And then that will then move into RHEL at some point. Uh, and that contains, as we said, the next update for RHEL. CentOS Stream, it sits between Fedora and RHEL. That's its purpose. In reality, though, that's not what happens. So <laughs> the reality is always different than the idea, right? So RHEL does lay downstream from CentOS, but CentOS, it receives updates from Fedora. It gets updates from other distros, and that could be all over the map. It could be from Debian, from Ubuntu. It could be from... Uh, open SUSE, it could be from Arch, but all of those are providing input into CentOS streams. And the kernel, which we've already talked about, that comes from kernel.org, and that all feeds into CentOS streams. So it's not, it cannot be purely a development environment for Fedora, because I think Fedora is way too far along in order to be a reliable development platform for most of these providers, and they know that. Uh, and they're staying with what they're doing. And the fact that 
Uh, you have you have Rocky and you have Alma Linux. Yeah. So you have Rocky and Alma Linux, which are now downstream of RHEL. Now we've not only got the old problem back, but we also have it done twice. So I don't know how many people have decided to go develop on that, but I'm sure there are some. So yeah, the well, the best well-laid plans. <laughs> Leave it. Open source will undo your plans in a hurry. Um, but that's the nature of where we live today. So the RHEL development team wanted Fedora to be the upstream uh, draw, but they couldn't do it because of CentOS de development for packages, as we saw in the last slide. CentOS wasn't going to work because its development pace was too glacial and too fragmented, and it required loopbacks into Red Hat in order to pull from Red Hat, push back the packages that were updated, pull from Red Hat. And so you are constantly doing things back into RHEL. I suspect that with, with Rocky and Alma Linux, that will continue. However, now that RHEL is derived from CentOS streams, they could go on a faster deployment schedule, which would help the other side as well. So CentOS Streams 9 and RHEL 9, they started out at the same point. They had the same code base. Now, RHEL, because of its update schedule, is slower. It's going to diverge from CentOS Streams because it has a faster release cycle. So the bottom line is the old method wasn't going to support continuous integration life cycles. Continuous integration, if you look at the historical meaning of it, it meant that I would build a little bit, test a little bit, release a little bit. So I was constantly on this kind of a conveyor belt of dropping off releases that the customers in the operational side of things could pick up and deliver. So it's really meant to go hand in hand with a, con a constant delivery model as well. But it doesn't have to. Um, the, the, the problem that we have, uh, and I've seen this firsthand, is that, and I've talked about it many times, but I'll talk about it again. So continuous delivery works great in some instances. It doesn't work so great in others. So there's two kinds of delivery models that have to occur today. The first one is running the operating system directly on the hardware. There's still a few of those, believe it or not. There's also dropping it inside of a virtual machine. There's also the, mean, the mechanisms of dropping it inside of a container. Um, if the container, now if you're running the container directly on hardware, it is going to have to use the operating system that the machine is running. But if you put it inside of a virtual machine, then you have your choice of what operating system or which distro you need for that particular container. So now you have the flexibility of building up exactly what, what is the ideal environment for each of those applications that you ultimately want to run. The problem that you have with continuous delivery is certification. Usually it's certification and that comes in the form of security compliance. It might be version compliance. It might there, There's a whole host of rules uh, and that depends on the environment you're deploying into who your end customer is, what their rules are. Yeah, it just, it can get very complex and convoluted. So Red Hat cannot, because of where it is, it can't deliver on a, on a CD life cycle. So not yet anyway. The problem is, is that all the rules and all of the procedures and processes that are, that make things operational would need to change in order to adopt a, a CI CD model some of them have moved, and some of them have not moved. <laughs> probably though some of those that haven't moved probably won't move. So that's a problem that I think RHEL will have for some time, at least. That's my opinion. So, so updates are performed on and can be uh, done on an accelerated basis, and that's where CentOS Streams comes in. It allows for that, and yet it can be a holding area to prevent it from leak, getting out into uh, the operational environment until it's been released for RHEL. That is all I had for today. Uh, I could take you through this. It's 
Uh, the install is, is no different than, than any of the other uh, rel based products. It is, yeah, it's all the same. Uh, but there, it, you will find that, yeah, it updates a lot more. But the, the other question is, what happens to the EPL? And those are packages that are held outside and normally are considered not free and not open source. So, or they're not, cons- yeah, they're considered proprietary or maybe they have aspects that are, that are not part of the open source model. And Red Hat, Fedora... CentOS, they all hold it off of their repos. You can install them, but you have to make that choice. So where do those still come from? We'll talk about that next time. And uh, thanks for listening, and thanks for being here. And bye for now.